you have any idea the impact and what you've done for us fat guys everywhere? Good hold, line drive, kick, and it is good! Welcome to the real winners and losers from week one of the UFL. The first ever games for the newly formed league, which of course is a mashup of the XFL and the USFL. The greatest collab of former rivals since Tupac and Biggie reunited in heaven. And now we know Biggie was just trying to get away from Diddy. The UFL drew an average of 11,000 fans across their four week one games, which is about 7,000 more fans than the Oakland A's had on Sunday. The inaugural weekend had everything, an insane last second win on a record setting play, a big upset, and of course the blot five plays. That's right. They're back. Even The Rock has invested in the Blot 5. What's the Blot 5? It's my favorite place. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. It's always fucking Blop. Blot 5. You just can't teach this. The first dicterception in UFL history by Quinterio Cole. I guarantee that's the only time that sentence has ever been uttered. Blot 4, winner for best cinematography, UFL cameraman. If you're not in danger of getting knocked out on the sideline, if you're not putting your body in harm's way, you're never going to get a great shot. Also, good job by number 29, AJ Hindi. I always judge a player uh, by their level of concern when they accidentally knock a cameraman out. Blot 3, Chase Garbers wanted his Easter dinner. I got dinner at 8.30, let's get this game over with. And sure enough, they got that game over with and came out on top. On a separate note, if I had to wait until 8.30 to eat dinner on Easter Sunday, I would be more pissed off than Judas. And I'd do worse things than he ever did. Blop 2, the super challenge. What's a super challenge, you ask? Is it working for David Tepper? Trying to maintain perfect eye contact with Sydney Sweeney as soon as your wife looks the other way? Well, in the UFL, as long as a team has a timeout, the head coach can challenge any officiating decision on the field. And Mike Nolan used his super challenge to see whether Battlehawks offensive linemen had flinched before the snap. He is challenged at 74, flinched. Gonzalez flinched, which he did. But we had actually looked at that already. He actually flinched after the clock hit 0-0. Zero, zero. So the, the period was over at that point, so there's no foul. So he loses his challenge. Making him the first coach to use and lose a super challenge. Blop one, the Roughnecks fought back into the game after getting dominated in the first half. They held Memphis to a 55 yard field goal attempt with 2.06 on the clock. The Boats doinked the kick, but Houston jumped off sides, handing the Boats a first down on that fourth and three. But wait, there's more because the next defense held true after that forcing a punt. Only two. Muff the punt, lose the ball, and ultimately the game. That's why I'm giving the Roughneck Special Teams Unit the Losing Unit Award. Lumped into that is also the rushing attack for both of these teams. Quarterback Jarrett Garantano was the next leading rusher with 22 yards. They totaled just 43. The Showboats had even fewer rushing yards with 34, but luckily had Case Cookus moving the ball with, for them with his arm. He was also their leading rusher with 16 yards. Cookus netted 201 passing yards in his UFL debut victory. Vinny Papale made one of the best catches you'll ever see, but I'll get to that in a bit. My winning throw goes to Cookus, who on third and 12 got blasted. Oh, Cookus is hit hard! But somehow floated this Easter egg to Jonathan Adams. Losing sequence? The Memphis Showboats defender Greg Reeves strip sack Jarrett Garantano late in the fourth quarter, his second sack of the game. And on the next play, the Showboats give the ball right back to Houston. It happened so fast, they were still interviewing Reeves, talking about the fumble he caused. A beautiful play, couldn't draw it up any better. Your guy was right there to get the recovery. Oh. He factor in. Man, my teammates always show up when it's time. He ended up getting hurt in this game, but Reuben Foster kept the Roughnecks in it. He recovered that fumble and had a pick earlier. That fumble, though, was the only reason Houston had a chance at the end of this matchup as that turnover led to a short TD. And no, I did not forget about the blop zero. I got sidetracked with the boats and necks. 
Boats and necks, boats and necks. Blob Zero goes to Gene DeLance, who got ejected <laughs> for spitting on opposing players. Flagrant personal foul, number 59 of the offense. He's ejected. So a lot to unpack here. Gene DeLance, after the touchdown, spitting on an opposing player. Brian Banks, the referee, and this crew decided to stick with it. Hey, your boy spit on me again, it's over. He spit on me again, it's over. Yes, get your boy. Now there wasn't a clip of Gene spitting, but I like to imagine it was like this. <laughs> oh, oh. It's terrible, nobody drink the beer. The beer has gone bad. My winning quarterback? It's going to the Gerber baby himself, Chase Garbers. The former Cal Berkeley and Las Vegas Raiders QB started his first game for the San Antonio Brahmas, completing 19 to 25 passes for a buck 58 and a pair of tutties. The most of any UFL quarterback in week one. He also rushed for a touchdown, giving him three total touchdowns for the weekend. Of course, he wasn't even the only player to throw a TD on his team. Garbers also scored on a QB draw to give his team a two touchdown lead in the late stages of the Brahmas victory over the defenders. Losing QB? Well, Jarrett Garantano struggled to uh, get anything really going for the Roughnecks, but I've gotta go with defenders QB Jordan Tayamu for not defending the honor of the great beer snake and letting the once mighty defenders get their asses handed to them by the Brahmas. Nobody even knows what the fuck a Brahmas is. I've heard cow, I've heard chicken. Honestly, I think it's whatever hat Cam Newton wears. I do know what a beer snake is, Jordan. It's the greatest mythical creature since Halle Berry played Catwoman. Tayamo threw the ball 45 times and never tossed it into the end zone. His 235 passing yards were the most for the weekend. And while I'm not mad, I am disappointed. I really thought the defenders would be the best team week one. Losing stat, the Brahmas, who were only one of seven on third down, but they won because they pushed the pedal to the metal on fourth down. No, that is not a Rasheed Rice reference, but they went three of four on fourth down. San Antonio only won a single game in the XFL last season, but they're already one and oh to start the year in 2024. One of their most fascinating storylines is that YouTuber Donald De La Haye, AKA Destroying, won the kicking battle for the Brahmas, but unfortunately, Mr. Stroying only got to kick off in his first UFL game after his one field goal attempt turned into the Brad Wing touchdown pass. And yes, this is our winning play. Punter slash holder slash king of swag, Brad Wing shuffled from holder to shotgun quarterback and then threw a 55 yard TD to his fucking center and one of the coolest plays we will see in any dang league. Wing said he wasn't supposed to throw it to the center, but he was wide open, so he did. I also think center should be eligible for passes every single play. If that were the rule in the NFL, Jason Kelsey would have more touchdowns than Travis. You know, if you throw it to a, to your center on the on a pass play, uh, it really wasn't the first option. So I told him, I said, I've never had a had a uh, punter go to the third read <laughs> and, and complete a ball for a touchdown. So I love it for fat guys. There you go, guys. I'm putting in number one fat guy touchdown all time. I don't care what Gold Junior says. And I wasn't sure if I was going to do this, but it needed to be done. We are handing out the Kirk Cousins Award. Of course, going to the quarterback who no matter what he does in the game, his team still loses. And I have to give this to AJ McCarron. He was the only QB to throw for over 200 yards and also have two passing touchdowns, completing 64% of his passes and still lost in heartbreaking fashion. That takes us to the game with the winning finish as the Battle Hawks fell to the Michigan Panthers in an upset. My winning player is a kicker in the upset of the week. Michigan Panthers kicker Jake Bates, who didn't even attempt a field goal in college, still drilled a 64-yard game winner at Ford Field. After A.J. McCarron gave the Battlehawks the lead with 49 seconds left to play in the game, E.J. Perry drove the Panthers to the St. Louis 46-yard line, setting up a 64-yard attempt for the win. Shout out to E.J. Perry for leading the league in rushing touchdowns right now with two. He balanced that perfectly while also leading the league with two interceptions. 
but back to Bates, who hadn't attempted a field goal during the other 59 minutes of the game. He hadn't even attempted a field goal at Arkansas, where he played college ball. He served as a kickoff specialist there for the Razorbacks. He did get some action for the Texans in the 2023 preseason, but he was only able to kick extra points. So, this was his first actual field goal attempt since his high school days in Tomball, Texas. Is that Tomball or Tomb All? I don't know. And at this point, I'm just going to pretend that this was the first time he ever even kicked a football. What did he do? <laughs> He fucking blasted a 64-yard game-winning field goal. It's the second longest field goal in Ford Field history. The first, of course, belongs to, sorry Lions fans, Justin Tucker's 66-yard game winner back in 2021. Bates said he didn't know if he would have to quit football and go back to his job selling bricks, where his biggest buyer is the Michigan-based Detroit Pistons. That's pretty good, huh, guys? But now he's a Panthers hero. According to Tony Paul of the Detroit News, the Lions have actually already reached out to Bates, presumably to kick footballs right at Justin Tucker's dick and put him on IR. It's pretty cool though to see a play of this magnitude happen week one. Now, the UFL got a lot of praise for its transparent officiating over the weekend, prompting people like Mike Florio of Pro Football Talk to say the NFL should adopt a similar approach that would end any rumors of the game being scripted. One of those instances took place in the Brahmas Defenders game when Wade Phillips challenged a potential false start on DC that eventually took a Jordan Tayamu to Kiki Cutie touchdown off the board. Not so cute now, are ya? There was a false start by number 59, the offense. There would be a five yard penalty from the previous spot. In the NFL, where it seems like they miss about 50% of false starts, or holds on edge rushers, it feels like that might be an appropriate thing to be able to challenge. Winning ball catchers? Well, there were some insane catches over the weekend. The type of shit that would be top 10 worthy in any NFL week. Probably the best catch of the week belonged to former Raiders seventh round pick, Marcel Aitman, who hauled in a spectacular 25 yard catch on fourth and 10 with under two minutes remaining in the game, then grabbed a game tying five yard touchdown from AJ McCarron with 54 seconds left on the clock. We also got a slick touchdown very slick touchdown reception from Mark Wahlberg's 27-year-old son, Vinny Papale, that extended the Showboat's lead in their opening game win over the Roughnecks. And you know what? I might have to track returners this year. Defender special teamer Puka Williams had the most kickoff return yards at 166 and punt return yards for 35 to open the season. Finally, the Stallions and the Renegades. The league kicked off in a very smart way, pitting the USFL champion Stallions against the XFL champion Renegades. Sure, the teams are very different now, and the Stallions didn't have Alex McGill slinging the rock for him, but I like this idea. Now, the Stallions proved interleague dominance behind a healthy dose of shut the hell up. Sorry, I'm, I'm really excited for the new Happy Gilmore. A healthy dose of running the ball. C.J. Maribel led the way with 67 rushing yards and a TD. Second most rushing yards of the weekend, trailing only the Panthers' Wes Hills. Ricky Person Jr. added a TD on the ground and one of the prettiest point after conversions you will see. And now, my dream is to get Ricky Person on the same team as Donovan Peoples-Jones. But... I have to give the Stallions a new award. My only in the UFL award honors go to the two-pronged QB approach actually working. The Stallions had the best offense of the weekend, 226 passing yards and 171 rushing yards, both tops in the league. Matt Corral got the start for Birmingham. Corral, of course, was drafted in the third round by the Panthers in that infamous 2022 draft class, but their offense didn't open up on the ground until they inserted quarterback Adrian Martinez, who churned out 52 rushing yards of his own. Corral is by far the better passer, and he's got a good amount of room to grow in that department. But he did hit Deion Kane with a dot to close out the half with the touchdown, and nicely extended a play during a two-point attempt to take a lead in the third quarter. 
Martinez only completed two balls on six tries while managing a, an interception, but his legs were a huge factor in helping Bernie, Birmingham get the dub. The most seasoned spring league player in spring league history, you might as well call Luis Perez a dry rub, hit Isaiah Winstead in the second quarter for my winning deep ball of the Easter Bunny weekend. Ultimately, though, it was Perez's ill-advised deep shot that cost the Renegades their bragging rights for league superiority. <laughs> and that's the real winners and losers from the UFL Week 1 debut. I don't know if I'm going to do this every week. We'll see how this does. We'll see how closely I can follow the league. But I'm glad spring football's back. <laughs> Subscribe here. Subscribe. <laughs>